Hello and welcome to the Believe You Can podcast. My name is Claire Fishenden and I'm your host. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited you're here. I am a mum to a little girl called Ruby. I have a background in musical theatre and acting. I run my own online business and I'm so excited to be your host for this podcast because I'm all focused about transformation, overcoming obstacles, building self-esteem and confidence and just knowing that you, if you put your mind to it and you believe that you can, you can achieve anything. Oh my gosh, I am so excited for you to hear this episode with Suan. It's absolutely incredible. It is amazing. I just want to point out that we cover some really in-depth topics. One of the things that we talk about is a, a traumatic experience that a woman goes through, but how she overcome it and she survived. It's amazing. And Sue Ann played that character in a play. Uh, it's just amazing. Anyway, Sue Ann is incredible. We unpick how being resilient and rejection that we have in the career and the ups and downs of that, of moving to new cities and and also how, you know, affirmations and gratitude really helped Sue Ann at a point in her life where she felt like she wasn't, you know, she was stuck and she wasn't getting what she wanted and how that has transformed her and that she continues to use those practices each day. So I'm so excited for you to hear this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. And yes, I'm just so excited for you to hear this episode. I'll see you soon. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to episode four. I am so excited and honoured to have Sue Ann Brunn on the call. So for those of you that don't know who she is, she's basically, she's epic, an epic all round human being. Um, she's an actress and a dear friend of mine. And I just I, it was when I was thinking about doing this podcast, your name immediately came into my mind, just because I feel like as friends and, you know, when we first worked together, we've been on a little journey together. We've always yeah. stayed connected and just, you know, it's just amazing. So we obviously met through Mamma Mia, which we'll touch on in a bit, but let's take you back. So Suan is from South Africa and now is living in the UK with her partner, Chris, and yeah, so let you, you take it over. So everyone, this is Suran, and I'm so excited for you to meet her. She does multiple amazing accents, by the way. I might have to ask her to do about five accents on, oh on the bounce. No, I'm joking. But um, yeah, tell, so let's go back, take it back to where it all began. Um, well, firstly, hello, everybody. And thank you so much for having me on the show. I am so excited to be here. Uh, and I think this is a really perfect way for you to continue to explore all the wonderful things that you've been doing over the last few years. So oh, thank you. Yay, I'm really proud of you. So yes, I was born in South Africa, born and raised in South Africa, which was, I mean, I had a really good childhood. You know, people, I'm very aware that politically it was a very, very turbulent time in my country. I grew up in the heart of apartheid. But, you know, there was so much that was kind of withheld from us by the government at the time. And so we weren't really aware. It was only when I got to university that I think I kind of went, oh. I mean, I'd been, mm. there was sort of murmurings and pricklings of me going, oh, that doesn't seem right at all. But I wasn't as clued up as I needed to be until I went to uni. Went to drama school, uh, dropped out after a year, much to my parents' absolute fury and horror, because my dad had spent a fortune on, on all the books and everything. And when I went back, because I went to university in Cape Town, and when I got back to Johannesburg, which is where we were living at the time, my dad was like, well, what are you going to do now? And I said, oh, I still want to act. I mean, I wanted to be an actress since I was three years old. I yeah, mean, it's same. never changed. Uh, and I said, oh, I still want to act. I just don't want to do it there. <laughs> and so he said, all right, you need to get an agent and you're going to have to go to work to pay us back for all the books. And I was incredibly lucky. I was signed by a legendary South African agent who just recently passed away, actually. Oh, um, to hear that. But, well, it's extraordinarily, her legacy has completely lived on. And her daughter, who is a fantastic filmmaker and director, and her daughter's uh, partner and wife have taken over the, uh, the agency, which is wonderful. Amazing. So the legacy continues. But I was signed by Munin and started working almost immediately and then spent about seven or eight years working in South Africa professionally as an actress, 
from the age of about 18 or 19. Uh, and then I moved to Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. It's one of them popping out. I lived in LA for like 11 years. <laughs> uh, and then I met my wonderful husband, who is British, and I ended up coming here. And I've been here for about 20 years. So, um, yeah. And we're so, so happy. <laughs> I'm so happy because that Chris brought you to in, living in England because then we got to work together on on Mamma Mia. Was that when you came to the UK? What sort of point was that in your career that Mamma Mia happened for you? Like for how long you'd been in the UK? Like about five or six years, actually. So when I first came to the UK, so I was in my mid 30s and I was completely daunted by having to start again you know I don't think anyone until mm. you've done it until you pack up and move halfway across the world wherever it may be and you start again I don't think anyone kind of understands how incredibly brutal it is particularly our industry the entertainment industry is not known for its kindness uh, <laughs> well it is I mean it is between us but you know what I mean it is a yeah it's, absolutely it's a absolute extremes and so much rejection and I kind of went when I went to LA I was this very big fish in my own country because I I became well known very quickly so I was famous in South Africa but it was like being a teeny tiny amoeba in a big pond and then suddenly I was like or it, in South Africa I was a big fish in this pond and then I was chucked overseas into Los Angeles, got signed by a really swanky big agency, but who had no time to explain the kind of details and what I needed to do. So I really was sort of floundering and kind of finding my way. I was all, I look back now and I think, what? I mean, I was 22 or three or something and all alone halfway across the world I had to learn to drive on the right hand side of the road, I had to get a driver's license, I had to live on my own, I had to learn to cook. I was like a very sheltered young woman. But I'm so grateful for it now because I think it really, really helped forge my personality and, you know, like steel. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. You, that's and that's what you need in 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 our industry. Yeah. And I think those skills are so transferable in, in, in so many other things, but unless you experience that kind of rejection and, you know, you kind of, I guess you felt like you were, you're fighting all the time, especially living on your own. And yeah. it's a constant, it's like a little bit of a battle, isn't it? But that, uh, just thinking about that, like for me, from my perspective, I feel I've lived quite a sheltered life in the sense that, you know, grew up in Essex, move, you know, I did go, move out when I went to college, but I still then came back to Essex and I, I've yeah. never really had that time where you're just on your own. So like, that's, that's amazing. But I, I, I bet that's given you so much, you know, standing for, for who you are today. Right. Yeah. And I think it definitely, I mean, at the time it was, you know, I couldn't see the wood for the trees. I just sort of hit rock bottom because also what I didn't realize stupidly I was like hello <laughs> what I didn't realize is that of course the entertainment industry by and large people bullshit a lot so I would go on a casting they would literally be like oh my god I love you you're so adorable you're so pretty you're so funny you're oh and that British accent oh I love it you're just adorable I love you we are gonna sign you tomorrow you've got the job you're so fabulous and then I didn't work for a year and I'd come from an environment where I was working all the time. If I wasn't acting, I was shooting films. If I wasn't doing that, I was on TV as a host. If I wasn't hosting, I was doing voice work to suddenly being told day after day after day how fabulous I was and I couldn't get arrested. Um, mm. And no one really prepared me, I think, because I was like, why, is, why does everyone say I'm so fabulous? And then I don't book any work. And of course, it took me a good while to go, ah, they do that with everyone. And they do it because, I mean, I don't know how it is now, but a lot of LA and a lot of the entertainment business is run <clears throat> on fear. <laughs> and yeah. so no one ever really tells you the truth in that department because they could turn around and go, if they did say, we thought that was rubbish. And the next month you get cast as the lead in some huge series and you become a massive star. 
you know, certainly in the 90s, you could have made someone's life really difficult as a casting director. Yeah. And so I think they they were very guarded. Um, and then there's this weird thing that instead of just saying thank you very much, and I, I still see it a little bit today, you know, where you where you go in for an audition and everyone's like, oh, that was fantastic. And you're like, don't, I don't need to be told it was amazing if you don't think so. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in is, is okay. I mean, yeah. if you genuinely were moved by it and you were excited yeah. by what I did, please do tell me. Yeah, um, absolutely. So yes, I'd been here about five years when I when I did Mamma Mia. And I spent the first year when I got here not working. I chose to do that. I was like, I just want to settle in because I'd done the kind of move once before. And it's a big thing to start again in a new country. And I'd gone, you know, LA is very self-contained. Everyone gets in their car, they drive somewhere. You don't walk anywhere. And London is the opposite. People walk all the time and you take public transport and the public transport's great. And so I'd never lived in a city like that, but I fell in love with London the moment. I don't know if that was because I was in love with Chris, but I kind of like mm. London felt immediately felt like home to me and, and and always has and LA never did never in not even in all the time I lived there I have got a love kind of love hate thing with LA I love it but it feels so fast it feels like and and that that thing for me I felt restricted like what you just said was when you're out walking in in the UK that I kind of felt like I wanted to do that in LA but yeah. you just can't can you it's crazy <laughs> I mean, you can in your area, but even then I lived on the beach and I remember very clearly like kind of walking away from the beach and sort of through the canals of Venice and people were kind of like, unless you're walking for exercise, that's acceptable. So you can kill yourself running up and down a flight of stairs, but actually just going walking. And I did a, a job in Atlanta <laughs> about two or three years ago and I decided to walk. It was the most beautiful day. And Atlanta's got these long blocks, but it's quite flat I mean there's a little bit of a hill and I could see the hotel but it was like a 20 minute 40 minute walk I don't know you know I was like I've got nowhere else to be the amount of people who stopped me like I stopped halfway to go and use the loo in a posh hotel <laughs> <And, laughs> of course ma'am can we get you a cab and I was like no 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 I'm gonna walk and he's like you're you're walking where where are you walking I said well, I'm walking to that hotel and he's like but that's 25 minutes walk I'm like I know that's all right I'm not <laughs> they were it's completely crazy. gobsmacked that I was walking it was like what <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny is it that is so yeah. funny and so actually while we're on in LA that's where you know I guess you you, you your fame began 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 um I'm going to say that because you're honestly so you are so talented and someone that I admire so much like, I, I, I don't think you know how much I admire you, but I hope you do now. But I just genuinely do. But that's when you had the role of Hathor in Stargate SG-1. Is that right? I've got that right, haven't I? Right. SG-1. And I, I mean, she's an Egyptian goddess, uh, isn't she? Which is wonderful. And yeah. let's talk about that. Let's explore that. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, I mean, Stargate has been the gift that keeps on giving. It was an unbelievable experience and I am still completely and utterly shocked that 25 years oh, 25 years later the character is still resonating with people and I don't know why that is I don't know if it was because during the first season which is when I appeared on the show and it ran for 10 seasons so I mean I was like right at the beginning I'm not sure if it was because they hadn't really had a villain on who was, you know, lots of the villains were kind of like aliens with five heads and things. But <laughs> suddenly there was this villain who was playing like a sexy, because in the story she, because Hathor in Egyptian mythology is a very benevolent, kind goddess. In Stargate, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> I love the eyebrow. <laughs> Stargate, she's a minx. And uh, there's a classic line that Richard Dean Anderson, who of course famously played MacGyver, and who is the lead in the show, um, there's a line where they talk about her being the goddess of fertility, inebriate, inebriety, um, and something else. And he turns around and he goes, you mean the, the goddess of sex, drugs, and rock and roll? And he's like, in a nutshell, yes. And I'm like, yeah, basically. <laughs> I love it. She has to uh, seduce all the men 
it was such a hard job so difficult um <laughs> she had to seduce all the men she kind of bewitches them with this mist that she kind of gets close to them and then blows the mist out of her mouth into theirs like a pheromone and then they all become a bit doolally and then in the episode all the women are like hang on a minute this girl is bad so um the women team up and sort of take her down and then I appeared in the second and third season very briefly in the kind of season finale um, and the season opener, um, or first and second, I can't, I can't even remember. And then, unfortunately, the character was sort of shoved over a, a wall into a pit of ice, never to be seen again, which is a shame because lots of people said, oh, but she died. And I was like, well, technically you never saw her die. So, and she's a goddess. I think she didn't die. I think she... One day she'll be back. Absolutely. Um, but what's been amazing is that when we went to Egypt on our honeymoon, the Hathor temple, which was trippy to say the least, really felt weird. I was like, oh my goodness, this is Hathor's temple. But sort of, so, so many weird things have happened to me, like serendipitous things. So on our honeymoon, on our, um, we were only in Cairo for a few nights and then we were doing all sorts of other things. And we had a guide who spoke really good English, but not like she was very proper and formal with us. And when we were in the museum, we got to this statue, uh, this statue of, of Hathor. And I said to her, do you watch, um, do you get American television? And she's like, yeah, sometimes. I said, oh, cause I played um, this character. I played Hathor on American TV. And she was kind of like, oh, and I was like, Okay, and anyway, <laughs> on we went. And, you know, Chris and I were kind of going, oh my God, look, it's Hathor. That night we go for dinner and we were being picked up the next morning really early to go to Aswan. So we're getting ready for dinner and Chris comes running into the bathroom. He's like, oh my God, you're on TV. I was like, what? And he went, you're on television speaking Egyptian, it's Hathor. <laughs> the next morning we're sitting in the lobby, 5.30, like, <laughs> And she comes in, she's like, oh, I see you last night on my television. Well, this Hathor, you are Hathor. Oh, I understand. I was like, oh. <laughs> we then didn't have to do another thing. Everywhere we went, we got like a police escort to the airport, red carpet onto the plane. I mean, it was extraordinary. Oh so my good, I love Hathor, it. I figured like, I guess Hathor approves. And then... You know, I've just done conventions all over the world. She's She has given back so much, this character and this part. And then of course, social media has been an amazing thing because you connect with people who are completely loyal and devoted to a particular fan base. And yeah. the Stargate family really are the most loyal, the most incredible fans. I mean, I've had people couple of people actually from Scotland come down to see Mamma Mia every Friday night for the whole time I was in it um wow. they support all the work I do that's and incredible when I, when I launched the podcast last year the Hathor hosts thing that obviously reignited I think kind of Hathor's yeah interest in Hathor and the show so it's she has you know it's just been an amazing thing and there is loose talk of a um a reboot of the series so I would love to be in it if that was the case. I'm just putting it out into the universe now. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, oh my gosh, I love that. I'm so, it's just, yeah, it's just amazing. It, it feels a little bit like Mamma Mia. Yeah, Mamma Mia's got a similar thing where I feel like Mamma Mia has, has, has done that for me. It's kept giving back. So did the show and then did the films and, you know, just, but not in obviously the continued way that, that you know that that Stargate has for you but it's just amazing never know. you never I mean, know you never know there's more no. there's more to come but also um just just on that like that's the thing that I talk about is we underestimate the the kind of and this can come in anything right raving fans like raving fans of something like yeah. I, I, like it's so amazing when people have got that they create a community around something a passion or something they watch you know whether it's products they use whether it's workout class like whatever it is that there's this community and I just think you know right now that is 
huge isn't it community is massive so you know if you're listening to this and you're not feeling you're part of an online community some way go watch stargate get involved in that or whatever it is just yeah. for me community is what like lights me up and as and what has got me through so many difficult times as well in life so anyway absolutely and i think the other thing is this way of being able to talk to people and find your tribe and as you said whether that's on a rugby pitch or in an opera class or an online zoom singing lesson or a quiz night with star wars fans or stargate fans or whatever floats your boat you know get yeah. up there and yeah join your tribe. find your tribe. find your tribe a hundred percent because when you do it the, the the things that come off the back of that are just are just yeah. amazing they're just it's, it's something that you can't describe and 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 for me like you know building the business that I do the or the online community that we get with that I don't know what I would have done like honestly yeah. I don't know how what, mentally from you know because I am someone and I've spoken about this on previous episodes that I'm someone that suffers with you know ups and downs and you know mental health and stuff like that I just feel like yeah I just think it's so important and that we continue having this online connection as well as when we can be with people in person um, I so Anne, I can't wait to hug you I just can't me wait too, me too so yeah obviously then we did Mamma Mia yeah. and oh just getting to watch you in all different parts actually uh, yes indeed literally indeed so spot on with all of the characters. So oh, what was your, what, how did you feel about Mamma Mia? Like, what did that give you? Oh gosh, Mamma Mia is another one actually that's been a highlight of my career. And I have to tell you a couple of funny things about Mamma Mia. So I had never seen the show and long before I moved to the UK, my mum had seen it. And every time she had watched the show, she would email me and say, you are so right to play Tanya. You need to get an audition to play Tanya. And I was like, oh, mother dear, you don't understand how auditions work. You don't just like pick up a phone and say to your agent, oh, I want to go and play the lead in this musical. <laughs> no, it's like, and I was like, I've never, I'm like, it's a West End show. I've never been, I mean, I'm ne they're never going to see me. And my agent at the time emailed every time the breakdown came out they'd email and every time I'd push and every time we'd hear nothing and then one evening I got another email from my mum saying oh I've just seen that um, somebody else who saw the show who just said I could just see Sue Ann in that role I mean she could play that part to a T I don't <laughs> understand why she's not on the West End stage and I was like thanks mum thank you and it was sort of like six o'clock in the evening. And I thought, you know what? I'll do one more push to my agent. And I said, look, I am aware that you're really doing everything you can, but if there's any way, cause the breakdown had gone out again, weirdly that afternoon. And I was like, you know, I don't know. If just get me in the door. That's, that's always yeah. the thing. It's just like, just get me in the room because then exactly. I can just do my thing, you know? Yeah. And whether it was just serendipitous timing, I don't know, but she emailed David Grindrod and at that moment he was about to leave the office, he got the thing and obviously looked at my CV and went, yeah, actually this could work. So I was called in to be first cover Tanya and then cover the other two, third cover Donna and then also sort of be Greek granny and ensemble. And I was delighted, I was like, you know, fine, I'm happy to go and do that. But of course I had to sing the winner takes it all because I have to see that you can do the songs. And I've never thought of myself as a singer ever. So I was exceptionally daunted by that. And I learned the song and I, you know, I had no idea. I went to go and see the show obviously. And I watched very closely what everyone was doing. And I think Kim Ismay was yeah. Tanya at the time. And Viv Parry was Donna and I think Lara was, Lara, uh, yes. Yes, was Rosie. So a really good uh, school to kind of watch. I just got increasingly like anxious about this audition. And, you know, anxiety when you sing is absolutely horrendous because it just makes everything close up and your voice gets higher and faster and breathing and all that. And I have never trained as a musical theatre actress. So I was sort of instinctively knowing what was good and what wasn't and but I didn't know how to fix it when it wasn't good anyway I went to to audition uh got through the first round got through the second round got through the third round by about the fifth round they were like right we want to call you in one more time and that's I think when I had to sing winner and does your mother know and everything 
and my audition was on a Monday. And on the Saturday night, I got the worst food poisoning I've ever had in my life. No. I still don't know what I ate, but I was projectile vomiting. It was horrendous. On the Sunday, I was so sick that I could barely stand up. I remember sort of like walking like a hunched old lady. Good Greek granny acting. <laughs> <laughs> this is, by the way, for anyone who's not seen the show, I'm not slagging off Greek grannies. That is a part of the show. <laughs> um, Love the Greek anyway. granny. And then, um, so I almost pulled out and I rang my agent saying, oh, I don't know what to do. And she said, look, let's reconvene tomorrow morning. Cause I think if you pull out now, you know, like we can do it. If you're not well, we'll do it. But I just, let's just see how you go in the morning. And I lay awake that night and I was like, please just let me get through tomorrow. Just let me be okay. And I woke up the next morning. I was like, I'm, I'll do the audition. It's fine. And I think because I'd been so sick and I was so focused on just not being sick in the room, I got out of my own way. I didn't focus on the nerves. I focused on just what I needed to. Yeah. Sung uh -huh. the best I've ever sung. I've still to this day never sung The Winner Takes It All like I did that day. <laughs> and <laughs> that, that is amazing. That. Isn't it funny? That's such a, that is so interesting because, you know, and, and we can actually come on to this next thing that I'd love to ask you about now is that what the voice in our head that's telling us we can't do something, oh. which is, by the way, it's bat crazy yeah. when you're, when you're singing and you're in an audition, like it is, it's like, you're not gonna hit that note. You're not gonna hit that note. And then you know, the production of saliva increases yeah. and then you'd like, but you can't swallow because you've got to sing. It's just crazy what goes on. The yeah. fact that that kind of something else overrided that, which happened to be, I don't want to be, probably I don't want to be sick, so I'm just going to yeah. go for it. And it and it was gone. Like, yeah. So what we say to ourselves, we can, we can shift. And that's what I'm so passionate about helping people mm. know that through affirmations, you know, through exercises for something that really, really helps me now, but I didn't actually sweat for seven years only on my upper lip, which was just not good. But now I'm, I like, if I, my day is like, when can I work out? That's, that's yeah, how I think that's now. Great. It makes me feel so good, but it also calms my like yeah. crazy, the crazy voice. I call my, my chimp, I call her Esmeralda. So I like, love it. Shut up, Esmeralda. Let's just not let's just not go there today. What what does she sound like? Oh, is she, do you know what? I've never thought about what she sounds like. But she's like, eat the chocolate. She's got. I feel like she's got a really deep. That's exact. Eat the chocolate cake. Come on, do it. Yeah, like <laughs> cat from Eastenders. Like oh, she's like. It. But then she's like, why did you eat the chocolate cake? Like yeah, I always I use that it. as an example to explain like how the you know our mind thinks and works because it's it's it can be kind in one moment and then unkind in the next, and it's yeah. just about calming that out and leveling it off. So I remember so fondly, and I couldn't even tell you when it was that we that we actually did this but we we've seen each other obviously over the years and connected but this one day Suanne and I met up in London we went we met for lunch yeah. and basically it turned into we I don't think we went home and until like 8 I think we left at and about 11 30 in the evening yeah and, so, and reluctantly only because they were kind of going it's time to go <laughs> it was oh I can't wait to do that again with you but I remember then because obviously you know, in the career of acting and you know what, in anything that you do in, in business, in life, in relationships, it, there is ups and downs. Like it's not, there's no straight line to anything. There's no, this in success, it's up and down. And it's all about how you kind of manage and deal with those situations. And I remember meeting up with you and like, you, you, you know, you're, you were, you were always really working for, for a long period of time when you was in the UK, right? And then there was a time when it wasn't like, and I mean this with like absolute love, but like the Sue Ann like fight and spark that you had, it was like the kind of fear of, or worry of like not working and that work not, not happening was sort of yeah. within you. And I remember we just, we chatted and then we talked about affirmations. I mean, you can share from your experience and stuff, but I just know that I just, I, I felt like that day, I was like your cheerleader of like, Sue Ann, you are incredible. You're one of, and you are, you're one of the most talented, versatile actresses I know. You know, personally, I just think you're amazing. So like, but how good was that day? It's just. That was incredible. And actually I can tell you, you're absolutely right. I was uh, 48 or 49. So my 50th birthday was looming. 
And you hear constantly, it is, we are so, um, as women, and particularly women in the arts, it is so drilled into you about the lack of female roles, aging, how it's not acceptable to age, how a man of 65 can have a screen partner of 25, and that's absolutely fine and nobody bats an eyelid, but God forbid a woman over 50 or 40 should have a love interest at all, you know, that 50 is no longer sexy. I mean, all I can say is thank God for J-Lo because she's, <laughs> she's like led the way and made but everybody go. You look absolutely, oh. if, you're, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see, but you just look absolutely stunning, flawless. Well, like you really you do so, so you don't you don't have anything to worry about on that front uh, <laughs> <Michelle>. absolutely <laughs> but I remember very clearly I was sort of I was unhappy with the agent I was at I wasn't getting in the room at all for auditions and the excuses that I was being given by that agent at the time was sort of like my age and that I didn't have enough experience and, you know, I'm all for paying your dues and working your butt off. I mean, I work hard, you know. Yes, people go, oh, you're so lucky. I'm like, yeah, I have been lucky, but I also I work really hard. Yeah. Um, and I was like, well, what can I do? What do I need to take more classes? Do I need to do? And there was just sort of nothing coming back from them. And I just bit by bit kind of felt my spark and passion disappear. And every self-tape, like when I rarely got them, became about like, the lighting and like, oh, my face looks fat and my wrinkles and, oh, I'm not good enough and I'm not acceptable and I'm the wrong size and I'm the wrong age and I'm never going to work again. And there's this big number looming and it's all just going to stop after that. And I kept trying to sort of make peace with it and go, well, OK, if it does all come to a crashing halt, that's OK. And inside my voice was going, it's not OK. I'm not done. I'm only just God, I feel like I'm just starting, you know, I'm just starting to understand what I can do with my work and, and, and I want to just get better and still act. Anyway, we met and I remember so clearly because the transformation in you has been absolutely remarkable. Okay. I vividly remember you and I having a conversation before I left Mamma Mia. You may not even remember this. We were sitting in some pub, I think, off Leicester Square and you were not in a great relationship at the time or like you were very in love but it wasn't like you weren't getting the love and respect you need honey yeah 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 um, and it was you know and we've all been there and there was that thing of like oh what's wrong with me instead of going no yeah you're <laughs> no, yeah <sorry. laughs> That's um, good. Uh, and I think and you were worrying about money and there was so much worry it was all this like all the fear that you had, you were like sort of pushing in like inwards and attracting that fear. And you've never looked back. And I am your friend. And I have seen firsthand the change in you and how you have embraced the kind of like, let me try this, the vision board that we can see in the back, which is phenomenal. And I had never done that. And I had read countless books about quelling anxiety. And I'd always try to approach it the same way. And I remember years ago, somebody saying to me, because I had some specific acting goals, and I some have achieved now and some I still haven't. And I was like, I don't understand. And I was so angry. And they said, it's because you keep trying to go up the mountain the same way. A mountain is a 3D thing. There's another route up. And God was like, Oh, yeah. And then I had this trauma of like, as I said, get turning older. And and again, the guilt that goes with that, because then you look a very dear friend of mine lost their daughter and she was not even 21. So there's a guilt that kind of goes, how can I be moaning and complaining about getting older when it's a privilege actually to age and I'm healthy and I should yeah. be able to embrace all that. And I'm an intelligent woman. I should be able to find something else to do. And I just couldn't get past it. And we had this wonderful lunch and you started talking about affirmations and I was like, mm, no, it's not for me. It's all, it's all but hug a tree and eat a cereal bar and you know, <laughs> sort of genuflect to the, I, uh, no, it's not for me. And you were like, no, it's not that. And I remember we had this remarkable day where everything, like every time you were my counterbalance. So every time I was negative, you were like, no, but there's this and you could try that and you could do this. And I came home and I asked you to help me with some 
uh, affirmations and you sent me like, which I still got on my phone. Oh, I love that. You You sent them to me. Five saying, these are what I do, but fix the wording to suit you. And one of them is that I attract whatever it is that you're looking for. And I just love that because it, I was like, that's the way to say it rather than going, I want and I need. It's that I attract because actually we are gregarious social people, particularly you and I. Yes. And that is what we do in person. We attract people to us that we want to spend time with. We all do it. You naturally attract what you want to be around. And I absolutely that just sort of like set the penny off. And I remember lying in bed and thinking, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. And I was like, well, so what if there's, what if there's no right or wrong way? You know, you so, we're so like hell bent on getting it right. Like I ask people, can you sing? And they go, no, 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 I can't sing. And then I said, no, I didn't ask if you could sing well. Can you sing? Of course you can sing. Everyone can sing. It doesn't matter if you can't sing well. Absolutely. You know, it's not about always getting it right, right away. And I lay in bed and I wrote three. And one of them at the time, I was worried uh, about, uh, and I haven't really had to stress too much about money, which has been a very wonderful thing. For a while, I was not making much money as an actor. And so I was sort of reliant on my husband to kind of help with everything. And I hated that. I was like, I'm a grown woman. I don't want to like always have to be there asking him. And so I wanted to change that narrative and I found a way to put that in an affirmation. And the other was that I was so freaked out about turning 50 and having no work. And so I just asked, I don't mind, it doesn't have to be the same as it was at 22, but I want to attract people who wish to work with me and the jobs that will be right for me right now. And then the hard thing is trusting it. Because you yeah. do, you know, I felt a bit silly at first. Now it's part of my daily routine. And that's all down to you because you mm-hmm. made me go. And then I remember us talking and I was like, oh, I don't know. Well, I have to tell you this because people are going to think I'm making this up. But so the night, the eve of my 50th birthday, I lay in bed, it was freezing cold. I'm a leap year baby, February 29th. There was no leap year. But I had been cast. I was desperate to do a classical play because I'd never done one. And I got cast in the lead of The Cherry Orchard. And it was a fringe production, but it was the lead. And it was the most amazing role. Ranyevskaya is a brilliant part. So that was in the January, February. And I woke up on the morning of my 50th. I got signed by a new agent. I went to audition for The Princess Switch. And I basically never stopped working that year I went from it's the first time since I was 25 that I went from a job to a job to a job to a job to a job somehow voice work just started kicking off and I was asked to do things I went to conventions and so it just went I finished the cherry orchard I did um summer of rockets for Stephen Polyakov I finished summer of rockets I had a day flew to Romania for three months to shoot princess switch came back I'd been home a day I got cast in a big commercial shooting in Slovenia. We were in Slovenia for two weeks, which was incredible. Got back that, yeah. cast in a musical, started rehearsals, got, did another big voice job, two conventions. It was the most fantastic year and it absolutely felt like the universe, God, just- Had your back. Like, Here you go. You yeah. are. Yeah. And you, all, all along that time, it's just gone like completely goosey, by the <laughs> way. It just makes me like, it just- you know, like all of, like what you were just saying about my personal transformation and, you know, me building the business, what it has given me so much is the tools, not only to help myself, yeah, but to help other people. Because when I first heard about affirmations, I was like, oh, they're a bit woohoo, like the same, yeah. like, you know, I, one, one I love is everything is working out for me. I just love that one. Everything yeah. is working out for me. But it basically the principle of it is there's a part of our brain. I'm going to get all sciencey now that I've gone done the research on it. Part of our brain called the reticular activating system. And it's a bit like, you know, like if I was just put a missile on um, and it could move location to, to where that needed to, to be. Yeah. It's a bit like that. Your brain is that, that part of your brain. So whatever you're focusing on. So if you're focusing on lack and fear and worry, that's what your brain shows you more of. 
So yeah. therefore, the more you see that, the more you feel you're getting that, the more you see you, you see less opportunity in situations. Yep. But when you start focusing on what it is that you want and the things that inspire you and make you feel good, the more your brain sees those things, it flags them yeah. as important. And I think the other thing is, you know, like, be kind to yourself if you start doing it. It's not an instant thing. It's not like, oh, I've done it for two days and life is fine. Yeah. And there'll be days where it won't work and there'll be times where it won't work. But one of the big triggers for me is because, and I can't even remember where I read or heard this, but I always try and come back to this. I was like, I, we speak to ourselves in the most appalling way. And I'm, I am really guilty of this, that if I'm having a bad day, my inner voice my chimp will start saying things like you've got no talent that very quickly becomes you're ugly you're useless you're fat you're old you're grotesque you're disgusting really brutal words mm. and if you look at people who come from very damaged backgrounds one of the recurring things is that they have been told consistently by a parent by a teacher by both that they are worthless and rubbish we start to accept what we hear and a friend i can't remember who told me this the first time but they were like would you ever speak to your husband or to your friend the way you speak to yourself i know such a slap in the face it was the thing i needed to hear because i was like no of course not i would never turn around and say to christopher even if he had put on weight i would never turn around and go you fat disgusting pig don't eat that no absolutely made me really stop myself in my tracks because i was like i the more i say that to myself the more i will start to believe that it's really hard though when you're negative and in that headspace to suddenly go i love everything about myself yes and i have not succeeded in that so what i've started to do instead is when i feel those feelings i stop and i go i'm just going to sit here quietly or stand whatever i'm doing I'm going to put some music on that always helps me and I'm going to list in my head 10 things I'm grateful for right now yeah and they change sometimes they're the same but it is astonishing that simple and I am by no means you know I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist but it's a tiny tip and it just takes you right out of that like (sighs) hatred of yourself to go yeah actually and even if it's something as simple as it can be something tiny that you're grateful for. It can be grateful for the fact that spring is on its way and it's lighter or, you know, whatever. But it is amazing. You can always find. And if you feel like you can't do 10, try five. Yeah, absolutely. There's, the, you know, I think what this this year has taught me is that the tiny things are the things that, mm-hmm. you know, that I took for granted before some things. And I think, you know, I feel like the world is healing because there's not so much things going on there's not so much transport so the, the the planet is 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 becoming healthier but I feel like it's is taught people and is helping people I know and I my my mission is to that this could help someone that's not feeling this way or they don't feel like great right now that something that we're saying can help you but I feel like a lot of people that I'm speaking to are feeling like I've really gone inward and I've really like looked at myself and like you know my health as well like you know the me at home workouts is the only thing that ever has worked for me before because when we're performing right when we were doing the jobs yeah we we naturally got exercise we didn't need to work out I didn't need to work out I was getting it so I never really consistently created a habit the one time I did I did Davina workout DVD and I was consistent with it and now I'm doing Peloton at home workouts and I just feel like oh my gosh because I've created that consistency whereas I always felt like I had to go to a gym yeah I had to do this and do that and that but actually the reality is is the things that we can do at home there's so much that we can do and and personal development and I'm actually we're actually I'm setting up this sort of club where we do like daily we come together to do like a sort of mindset morning and exercise and using some using some simple like supplements alongside that to help people feel good like so they yeah. think well they feel well they eat well and they move well you know yeah. to, to, to be well basically but I just think that 
for you as well, like to be working, like I know you have so much gratitude to be working at this time and that'd be something that you would do, but every situation is kind of alien to us now, isn't it? It's a different experience that you've experienced maybe from this film to the, to the previous ones as well. We just talk about that. You then went on to play Mrs. Donatelli. I love Mrs. Donatelli. (laughs) Guys, you've got to watch the princess switch. The princess switch is now a franchise. There's three films like, and you're, in all of them like it's just amazing it's actually amazing I mean the first one we were we shot it midsummer in Romania it was really casual you know I think kind of Vanessa Hutchins is the star of the film and and she's fantastic but it was much more the film's budget wasn't as big as it is now because obviously it hadn't been released yet and we just sort of had this really wonderful family type time and it was really chilled and relaxed and then the second film, because the first film did really well, the second film, it felt like the everything was bigger and it just got, we went Hollywood on the second one, which was great. Yes, we love that. middle of winter in Scotland, which was challenging, <laughs> um, but fantastic. And again, I think we were so lucky because we'd had that time in Romania. We really genuinely all get on fantastically. You know, it's, it is like a little family. So it was fabulous to be reunited and see each other. And then this time, it was wonderful to see everybody, but it was very like the shadow. So the way mm. everyone works is different. We were shooting outside a lot, uh, which was very challenging in January and February in Scotland. But I have to say the gratitude across the board because everyone just kept going, Do you know what, doesn't matter. We're here and we're working and we're making it happen. Yeah, so, so good. But I'm so, I'm so proud of you. And, and you know, going back to that time when, you know, we've all had a time where we've been in a in a valley and, you know, but the, the transformation is amazing. And I just know, like I said, I know you're going to work until you're 202. Like, I that's, hope so. That's going to be a thing that we're alive until we're 202. I hope so. That's next year then. Yeah, um. <laughs> no. But thank you so much for coming, for coming on. I honestly appreciate it so much. And I know that the listeners would have got so much value from, from your tips and just hearing your fabulous stories. Honestly, Sue Ann has got the best stories <laughs> about sharks are the most just let's quickly just touch on I always tell people about the shark stories by the way that you used to tell me I remember you explaining a story of someone punching a great white shark on the nose well I was at school with yeah yes not he wasn't at my school because I went to an all-girls school but yeah a shark attack and he whacked it on the nose I mean, yeah. I can't really remember more. Than- <laughs> <laughs> I just remember it so vividly when you said it. Maybe it was a thing that had happened recently, or I basically delved into because I'm fascinated by sharks. I don't know why. I've got a real, I've got a real thing about them. But, but also, just lastly, just the when you went, you recently, well, a couple of years ago, went back to South Africa to play a character. And oh, oh, yeah. can you just touch on that story? And oh my gosh, it just... Yeah, I mean, really talk about resilience. This is like, it's almost, if I had not met her and spent time with her, I wouldn't have believed it. But in 1994, I think it was, or 96, a South African woman called Alison Boerter, She was taking her friend home early in the evening in a city called Port Elizabeth, which is a seaside town. It was midsummer, it was December. And they'd all been on the beach all day. And and when she got back to her own flat, the spot where she normally parked was taken. And so she drove slightly further down the road, parked her car. And as she was leaning over to get her laundry, she heard the car door open and a guy with a knife held the knife to her and said, move over um, or I'll kill you. And she was 25, I think. And of course, can you imagine? She was just like, uh, and what proceeded to happen is that this man drove around town with her in the car, car was unlocked. And the amount of time she was like, can I run? What will he kill me? Will he stab me? And then he went to pick up another guy who sat in the back and they kept telling her that they weren't gonna hurt her, that they needed to go and pick up a television you know, as long as she did what they said, they wouldn't touch her, they wouldn't hurt her. And I think she naively believed them. And after about two hours of driving around, they ended up on a really deserted coastal road where they raped her Mm. and then slit her throat multiple times. Um, I think something like 19 or 20 times and she was stabbed viciously in the stomach repeatedly. 
uh, when they were in court, they talked about wanting to destroy her womb. So she had been completely lacerated in her stomach. At the time, she was wearing a full piece bathing suit, a pair of sandals, a pair of shorts and a denim shirt. They tossed everything out the car. She was obviously naked, stole her car and drove off. Everyone thought she was dead. She then wakes up. In fact, she wakes up. I, just talking about it gives me goosebumps. She mm. wakes up as he was slitting her throat because she said she could hear this sound, this like, <sighs> and she was so disorientated. She had no pain though, weirdly, but she said she could see his arm moving like this and counting. She could hear counting and he was counting the slashes. I mean, it's grisly stuff, but remarkable. Anyway, she wakes up to find her throat is, so she, her whole head was back. She had to like support her own head. She tries to get up and realizes she can't. And by now she knows their real names because they gave her fake names. So she's lying there basically dying. And she wrote their names in the sand. And below that, I love you, mom. And then she said she had a thought where she thought, hang on, maybe I can get up and walk to the road and somebody will find me. And you know, this is now three, four o'clock in the morning in the middle of nowhere. And it was a full, full moon because she talks about these miracles that saved her life that night. And one of them was that it was a very warm evening and that there was this unbelievably bright full moon. And she just didn't have the strength to get up because her guts, her intestines were out. And she said she lay there accepting that she was going to die. And then, you know, she said, I didn't hear angels or hear a voice, but I was aware of something. And this thing, this presence sort of lifted her up. And she said, and suddenly I looked, I was above the ground. I was looking down at this broken, battered, bloodied body, which I knew was me. And I could see the road was over there and it wasn't that far. And in that moment, this feeling sort of said it's okay if you want to stop now or you can go back and fight and she said within a second she just went Whoo! and she was back in her body and she was like I'm gonna fight and she got up she put her intestines in her shirt she still had her shoes on amazingly and held her head like this so that it wouldn't flop back and walked painstakingly to the road and then went and lay in the middle of the road because she thought at least that way they'll see me in the meanwhile, a group of students, uh, of which a 19-year-old boy who was a veterinary science student, were coming home from a party at about four in the morning and saw her in the middle of the road. They first thought it was a buck that had been hit. And then they didn't want to get out of the car. Um, and it was before mobile phones or anything. Well, I think they'd just come out. So they were like those big old fashioned ones. They couldn't get signal. So two of them went down the road, further down the road to get signal and call an ambulance. And this man who saved her life this, he was 19 at the time, got out the car, walked up to her. And he always says, it, her book is extraordinary. Her book is called I Have Life. And the book deals with, each chapter deals with her story from a different point of view, from someone else's. So in his mind, he, he was like shaking and terrified because she was covered in blood and her eyes had hemorrhaged. But he knew somehow instinctively not to let her see his fear. So he took her hand and he established quickly that she could understand him and she could squeeze his hand. And he said, you know, yes, for, once for yes, two for no. And in that time, they established that two men had hurt her. Um, they covered her up. Eventually, an ambulance came. They got her to a hospital at about six in the morning. And just at that moment, there was only one thoracic surgeon in the entire country. And he was going home. And he saw her being wheeled in. And he thought, well, hang on a minute. And he saved her life. She was under, I think, for nine or 10 hours. And of course, at this point, hadn't spoken everyone thought she was going to die. Her mother was contacted. Her mother is very religious. Her mother immediately started a massive prayer group. The whole community started praying for her. And the next morning when she woke up, by now in excruciating pain, because I think the adrenaline and everything else kind of got her through it. She woke up and the police were in the room and the female detective, because I think they had, a, they had an idea of who these two men were. And the, there was a male cop and a female cop and the woman said to her, look, I know you can't speak. And Alison spoke. She said, yes, I can speak and I can tell you their names. And everyone was like, oh! And they had missed her vocal cords, I think by about, I don't know if you can see that, like this much. And so they, needless to say, they went and got the guys. They were so confident that she was dead that they'd parked the car outside their house. They were making sandwiches with the knife that they'd stabbed her with. 
Um, and of course they both, the kind of leader of the two, when they confronted him, because they split them up, and when they confronted him and said, she survived and she's identified you, the lead detective said he could tell there was a moment of the guy going, that's an event, it's not possible, no one could survive that, and he went, well, she did. And then they just kind of, I think, folded and went, oh God, okay, we did it. So they both are still in prison, they got uh, life, rightly. And she then went on to become a motivational speaker. She was one of the first women in South Africa where rape is a massive problem to kind of come out and talk about how there's no shame uh, attached to it. She went around the world. She wrote this book. She then, the amazing sort of happy ending is she went around the world. She still today is a motivational speaker. She's the most extraordinary woman. Talk about resilience and somebody finding the positives in life and changing things. Mm. And the man who saved her life went on to become a doctor and delivered her second son. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. Because yeah, he was so profoundly affected, I think, by the whole thing that he changed his degree and rather than doing uh, veterinary st uh, science, he decided to become a doctor and he delivered her second brother. Oh, that is incredible. Right now, both kind of grown up boys, you know, like they're sort of 12 and 15, I think, or something. Oh, gosh, amazing. And uh, yeah. you you had the, it was a play, it's a play, isn't it? Yeah. And so you had the privilege of... So I had the privilege, the challenge and, mm. the, and the absolute, I mean, it was the most extraordinary experience to be in because when we'd read the book and I wanted to make a film of this years ago and I didn't have the money and I didn't have the rights. And then the director and I were chatting. She came to London for lunch and I was telling her the story just like I have for you, with you now. And she was like, and I got to the end of the story and she went, Swanee, this is a play. And I was like, really? And she went, yeah, we're going to make, we're going to do this as a show. We're going to do this as a play. And we sort of devised it. And then we were like two weeks into rehearsals. And I remember thinking, this was a terrible idea because so much of her, when they're in, the, firstly, it all happens in a car. And for me, when you see a car on stage, I think Jersey Boys and Grease. I'm like, so automatically I was like, that sets the wrong tone. And lots of the action happens in the car. Secondly, I was like, how do we portray a violent rape and attack mm. on stage and then make it convincing, but also make it that people are not going to be, Ugh because yeah. it's so hideous what happened anyway. And finally, I was like, how the hell do we convey her thoughts? Because when you read the book, that whole first three hours where they were driving around, she constantly, like twice, a cop car pulled up next to them and she was like trying to signal with her face. And so there are all these ex gripping things where you're like, oh my God, just get out of the car and run. Why didn't you run? And it was one of the things I asked her, I said, why didn't you get out? The car wasn't locked. And she went, you know, I, I don't know. I believe them. I believe that they wouldn't hurt me. I had no idea that they would attack me. They kept saying they wouldn't hurt me. Mm. And then our director came up with this brilliant concept, which when she told me, I thought, she basically said that we would have, we used bean bags, which sounds like, oh goodness, this sounds like a student production. <laughs> We used bean bags that were colored, the color of a stone and a rock. And they became multiple things. There was, we had about four or five and they became a table. They became the car, they became a hospital gurney. And then there were five people in the cast. I was the only person who didn't change roles but everyone else changed parts. Yeah. Also good because the two guys playing the attackers she wanted to give them an opportunity to also play like a nice doctor, you know, so that they, didn't have to be quite so live in that space. And then we devised this way that I would, I would talk and then someone else would talk, finish the sentence. And at first it was a bit weird, but it becomes very clear very quickly that it's her thoughts because I was sort of doing the facial stuff and they were then behind me talking. And we used men and women for that and it worked brilliantly. Amazing. And then the most incredible thing is that she came to see the show. She came to the press night and she came to the sort of previews and then a week after. And I was very freaked out about doing the kind of like rape and attack scene. And, you know, when she stabbed, I was like, oh, how is she going to? Because she, she had said to me, I don't really, when I tell my story, I don't focus on that. And she talks a lot in the book about the minute they started physically attacking her not the stabbing because she passed out for that which is again they think saved her life 
but when they were raping her she immediately she had these remarkable instincts to just kind of go it's not me and she said again she sort of like removed herself and she talked about putting her hands on the car like that so that she wouldn't and she wouldn't look at him she was just like that but calm and in the show we decided not to ever do anything nude so we we did a lot of it stylistically so there's he describes what he's doing to her and then we use this thing of again her thoughts mm -hmm. and then with the stabbing we did a thing where on one side of the stage they were just doing like the motion but in slow motion and on the other side we had a very normal conversation happening which was actually way more chilling than anything because people were like oh yeah and she came to see it and we got to the end of the run through and I immediately went to her and I hugged her and I said you okay and she was like gosh um that was so powerful and I kept thinking that woman is so brave and I said, that woman is you. And she went, I know, but I guess I never really thought about it like that. And she and I said, yeah, you, you're amazing. And then on the press night, because we decided to end the show on a happy note. So the play ended with somebody announcing off stage, going, ladies and gentlemen, Alison Butter. And then I come on as her dressed in a suit. And it opens where she, oh. she talks in her talks about the ABCs you know, of life and that. So I started and then it just, and then we got to the curtain call and I went, ladies and gentlemen, the real Alison. And people went crazy. Oh I mean, my gosh. Did you come on every night? For the time she was there, cause she yeah. lives in another city. So <gasps> she stayed for two oh my gosh. every night. And we brought like, I mean, I've never ever done a show that's had such an effect on people. And across the board, like the poor guys playing the attackers, like one of them, but I mean, it changed his whole career because up until that point, he'd done musicals and always played the kind of camp prince or something. He was so terrifying and so good that he actually won a best actor award for it. And you know, amazing. He, but he would come out into the bar afterwards and he said women would just be like, like that which is why we wanted to give him another role as well in it yeah because it's it's that thing is it? it's even when you watch something and there is a sort of chilling character or something it, it like you do feel a certain way about that person exactly. even though you know they're acting you're like exactly. so that was good that they had that diversity oh my gosh yeah. like what a, an empowering story that oh and people that someone can overcome that and that's the thing isn't it yeah. it's like what you know sometimes in everyday life you know with myself i can you know, feel a certain way. And, and sometimes it's just like this, there's always someone out there that's gone through something and got through something mm -hmm. smaller, bigger, you know, and what, what a woman, oh my gosh. But the fact that you got to do a job, this is the, this is the thing, right? A job and a play a role that creatively challenged you, inspired oh. you like, yeah. and, and that's the thing about like for me is feeling that creativity so that's like, I feel like I'm always going to be, you know, I, I haven't worked for a while now and I absolutely, I've got Netflix on a Netflix uh, on my vision board up there. Oh. It's happening. It's happening. I want to, you know, I, and I know in my heart that it will, that that will happen again for me because I, yeah. I want to be an actor forever. So yeah. I just think it's, you know, just bringing this back to like knowing and believing that you can, like whatever it is that you want to do, believe that you can do it. And that if you keep striving for something, that it's possible. And sometimes that might take you around the mountain a different way. And Absolutely. you might end up on a different mountain, yeah. but it's it's doing things that fuel your creativity, that that make you feel good. And yeah. um, I just, that story, honestly, it's, it's always stayed in my heart that a lady like that could overcome that. And then you could play that role and, oh, it's just- Well, it was, it was a privilege amazing. to play it because it, I mean, there was not a night, we did six weeks. Uh, it was a very hard place to live physically every night to know that I had to go through that because I was dragged around and beaten up. I was covered in bruises, but it was so rewarding to get off stage and every single night, and I still to this day get letters and people contacting me on social media saying that it had a profound effect on them. And I think, again, getting back to what we're doing right now, you know, I think in believing you can, something else that I found massively helpful because lots of people don't believe they can. They just don't. Mm. But, uh, and I hear so often, and I do it sometimes, I'm like, well, it's probably not going to happen and that won't happen. It'll never work out and it won't be like that. 
We all do it. It's okay. Ask yourself, go, okay, it might not happen, but what if it does? What if it can? Because there's always that flip side. Yeah. And that's really helped me a lot when I've been like, oh, I'm not even going to bother applying for that or, you know, trying to get into, when I did my talk show, I was like, God, probably no one's going to watch it. And, you know, I had a few moments of like, why am I even doing this? This is ridiculous. And I haven't been, Ugh. and then I was like, well, what if it does work? And yeah. even if it doesn't work, as in like you break YouTube, <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's not about that. That is and that you love. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And and just to, to finish up on that, for my watch, I've got a, a kind of gold wrist strap. And one of my favorite quotes of all is whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're absolutely right. So thinking that you can is yeah. is the biggest gift you can give yourself because in, in thinking that we can do something we we open the doors and opportunities for other things like you said it might take you down a different road but yeah. it's just so magical and we believe in you anyway like I, I might not have met you you might be listening to this be a stranger like but we I think other people can hold belief for other people as well so just just do the thing whatever it is whatever you feel like just yeah and just being it being it choose every day that you, and know that you are in control of your thoughts and your feelings and how we respond to things because that's what we are in control of we're not in control of the events and what exactly. you know what happens to us like that that amazing woman but we're in control of how we react and respond to exactly. those things after the after the time and be kind to yourself talk to yourself like you would to a good friend or somebody yeah. you love whether that's a parent uh, a partner a friend remember that when you're being vicious to yourself because we all do it it's human nature you know yeah and they suddenly come in and I'm like <laughs> <laughs> oh oh thank you so so much I appreciate thank it so much and um thank you for that having me I've yeah. loved it what can you spell out your insta just so people can come there yeah so it's at suan which is s-u-a-n-n-e and then b-r-a-u-n amazing there all, we go all lowercase amazing so incredible <laughs> on twitter i'm very I'm <laughs> very easy to find yeah amazing oh thank you so much appreciate you so so much thank you Bye. so much i Bye. love Bye. you for having me